But through archaeology, we know that that fire was confined to one or two rooms. It started in the parents' bedroom. We, we can identify exactly where that happened. But it didn't completely destroy the house. Less than three years later, Father Washington, Augustine Washington, dies. 1746, it's a great case. Uh, George is being pressured by his older half-brother Lawrence to join the British Navy. Um, and Mary prevents this. We're going to go into that a little bit more. 1750, there's a trial. One of the enslaved people murders another enslaved person. And there's a trial. Harry is found guilty, and he's hanged for this offense. 1751, George is swimming in the Rappahannock River, and someone steals his clothes. <laughs> okay, and it's hard to understand the context. All we have is the court records. Is someone sort of flirting with him? Clothes were very expensive. It was a big deal if you stole someone's clothes. And in fact, uh, two indentured servants are accused of it. Uh, one of them is whipped bareback. Okay. I don't think I would psychologically recover from being whipped bareback in the middle of town. So these are two events that are happening at a time when Mary Washington, his mother, is managing this plantation, and there are all these hiccups going on socially. There are these court trials that are going on that may suggest to some people that maybe the home isn't being well managed, and so the family has to work on ways to compensate for that. George joins the Fredericksburg Masonic Lodge in 1752. He ascends to the next level in 1753 and becomes a master mason here at the local lodge in 1754. And 1754 is when he eventually moves to Mount Vernon. His older half-brother has passed away. He initially rents Mount Vernon from his sister-in-law. And when all their children die, George inherits Mount Vernon outright. And so 1754 is when he changes from calling Ferry Farm his mailing address to Mount Vernon. His members of his family continued to live at Ferry Farm um, until 1772 when his mother moves into town and she enjoys a long life here in town. She's lived, she lives closer to her daughter Betty who lives at Kenmore, our George Washington Foundation's flagship. And you can walk between her house, and you can see both these houses today. So those are the major events that happen at Ferry Farm. So we understand that there's a lot of stress that, financially, that George and the family experiences at this time. And in a letter in 1788 that he writes to a close friend of his, there's seats up front here, my young friends. <laughs> Don't be shy. In a letter that he writes to his friend, this is just after the Revolutionary War. He's experiencing a lot of economic strife, and he likens it to the time when he was a boy of 15 in 1747. So all these years later, that's still a period of his life in which he remembers there being great economic stress. One bit of evidence for that stress may be this notion that his older half-brother Lawrence has to get George to join the Navy. And the foundations created these exercises for young people and students to learn about the difference between primary documents and secondary documents. There's a lot of documents that are related to this that have preserved. Um, Lawrence involves George in a conspiracy. He gives George two letters. One he's to read and one he's, he's to give to his mother. And he's trying to convince her that this would be a good move for George. Um, she consults different people. There are people in town that write back to Lawrence and say, you know, there's a few things that, such as an overly fond mother object to about him joining the Navy. Also, and she, um, she asks her brother, uh, George's uncle, Joseph Ball, in England, what he thinks. But his letter, while it preserves, doesn't get to her in time before she ultimately tells George, I really don't want you to do this. And George respects that and does not join the Navy. Now, this painting I find very interesting. It's done in the early 20th century. George is 14 years old when this is going on. 
that does not look like a 14-year-old boy to me. And this next image shows something more. It's also done in the early, probably the late 1800s, early 1900s. That's a little more like what a 14-year-old boy looks like to my mind. I looked up uh, what boys who joined the British Navy, how do we contextualize that? And in London, you know, this is a way that London street, uh, clears the streets of orphan boys. You just put them in the Navy. And for 14-year-old boys, one-third of them die within the first two years of their service. And the article I read didn't go after two years. Okay, So there's a real good chance if Mary allowed George to join the Navy that there's a 33% chance that she would never see him again. But biographers sometimes see things differently. And Samuel Elliott Morrison makes it clear that he thinks Mary's decision was a selfish one. And that's the thing about this episode, too. You know, you can go and you can have a healthy debate about it, and you can come down on either side of the issue, okay? Joseph Ball, his uncle, says that George could make as good or better a living as a planter. And secondly, the fact that he was born in Virginia, he would not enjoy the same rights and privileges as other people in the Navy that were born in Britain. As a colonial, he could not raise as high in the ranks. That's just a conceit that the British had. One of the things that starts rankling the colonists at this time. So, who was Mary Washington? Was this a selfish decision on her part? Or was it one in the best interest of her son? And where George is concerned, I have to think about you know, he lived at Mount Vernon on the shores of the Potomac River. Every time he goes to Ferry Farm or Williamsburg, he's going by horse. He could have gotten on a boat and gone to those places, but he never does. It doesn't seem to me that the water really calls to him. <laughs> so what does George say about his mom? In 1784, addressing the citizens of Fredericksburg, he, said, he refers to her as his revered mother, by whose maternal hand, early deprived of a father, I was led to manhood. In her obituary, I just happened to pick the version of the Connecticut Gazette. The same obituary appears in a number of newspapers. But they use words like virtue, prudence, and Christianity to describe her. These are contemporary accounts. And then here's a friend, a cousin of George Washington. This is a pretty famous quote. I know a lot of you are already familiar with it. Um, of the mother, I was 10 times more afraid than I ever was of my own parents. She awed me in the midst of her kindness, for she was indeed truly kind. All right, here's our friend Samuel L.A. Morrison. If you remember, he thinks Mary's selfish for not letting George go in the Navy. Here's how he describes her. Grasping, querulous, vulgar, selfish, exacting. Okay. Based on the historical record, I don't think this is a fair assessment. I think Mr. Morrison has some issues. <laughs> <laughs> so who do we believe? Here's this continuum of, is she virtuous, prudent, kind, maternal? Is she grasping, querulous, vulgar, selfish? Can we get at that now? hundreds of years after the time she lived. There's a court held in 1753. Our so sovereign lured the king against Mary Washington. I'm just saying, when it comes to rebelling against the king and fighting the king and winning, George gets it from mom. <laughs> because Mary wins this case. So in 1753, she, along with about a dozen other planters in the area, are accused of growing tobacco seconds. And I've talked with friends of mine, we've analyzed this court case just uh, casually. Um, and what they often do is they're like, oh, she was growing second-rate tobacco. But that's not quite true. And I, Americans hate nuanced explanations. So hold on to your seat. <laughs> So what happens with growing tobacco seconds? When you harvest tobacco and you cut it, if it lies in the field, suckers will come up. 
and if those suckers get to be nine inches high, you're accused of growing tobacco seconds. So in 1753, and again in 1754, Mary Washington is accused of growing tobacco seconds. And remember, there's a dozen other planters in the area, all males, by the way. She is the only female. So this is telling you that the community recognizes that she's managing this plantation, that she's responsible for what's being grown there, and she's being held responsible for those things. But she is acquitted, as are all the planters that are accused of this. So what's going on? What is happening here? Is this guy not measuring properly when he goes and measures? You know, we're in competition with Maryland for growing the best tobacco, and what this law is designed is to make sure Virginia tobacco is the best possible. Did something happen and they just didn't get around to dealing with the tobacco? Was there some mistake? Did this commissioner that does this measuring, was he asking for a bribe and she refused to pay? And so he puts her on a list and takes her to court. One thing my friend said as we were discussing this, he's like, well, we'll never know. We'll never know if she was growing tobacco seconds. But she was found innocent. We have a jury of 12 men. We have every one of their names who found her and all the other people that were accused of this innocent. And what fascinates me is that this friend's conclusion was, gosh, we'll never know. What more evidence do you need? <laughs> what is it about a woman growing tobacco and being accused of this and found innocent that still seems implausible? I think there's something there. So how can the archaeology of Fairy Farm contribute to our understanding of Mary Washington? This is a whole new set of data about this woman that we haven't had access to in the past. And I have to credit, you know, Dave Moraka has designed how we excavate there. And see, I think we're so close to it, it's hard to appreciate what an innovative technique you're looking at. Every single one of those five foot by five foot units have been excavated. That's really unusual. Most sites can't afford to do that. It's expensive, and as you all know, it takes a long time. The community's waited for these results for a long time. I think you're gonna be pleased with those results. Every square inch of that soil is excavated by hand and is screened, and every artifact's kept. We don't just keep the artifacts that date from the Washington's period. We keep all the artifacts, and they all have to be processed, and they all have stories to tell. Fairy farms, soils have many, many stories to tell. So we've excavated over 900 of these five by five foot squares. And one of the reasons we want to excavate so much is to find not only the main house, but all the support outbuildings that supported that. The, the, the kitchen, the laundry, the storehouse, the stable, um, but what's more is we want to find things called small finds artifacts. And these are small artifacts like buttons and buckles and teawares. We want to get a good sense of what these sort of socially meaningful things uh, that the Washingtons had. And so here's a good example. This is our entire assemblage of curtain rings. <laughs> Three in 900 uh, test units. Most projects, you know, I used to do uh, work for a for-profit archaeology company, and in federal law, excavating 10 to 15 percent of a site is considered plenty. Full, that's full mitigation, 10 to 15 percent. Most do 12 percent. That's about 140 units. We needed 900 to find three curtain rings. Now, that's the uh, probate inventory at the bottom. There's a set of window curtains there. That's not even enough rings to cover that one set of window curtains, okay? So this thorough excavation technique and the patience that the community and the foundation has shown us while we collect this data is giving some pretty incredible results and sort of saying something about the way archaeology is done in this country and just how much information we get versus how much we dig. It really matters. Um, so let's talk about health and hygiene. <laughs> okay, 
one of the ways the Washingtons, they, they want to show there are these court cases, they want to show that they're refined and civilized. Um, there's a theory in Europe that there's something naturally degenerative about the new world. The longer that you're here, you're going to lose your civilization, you're going to become weaker, maybe not as bright, you're going to become effeminate. One of the lines of evidence that they show, there's a guy in France that writes 42 volumes of support for this theory. Um, and one of the things they say is like, look at the panther. The panther doesn't have a mane, okay? A proper African lion has a big, thick mane. New World lions, panthers, and pumas don't have manes. That shows you how weak and effeminate they are, okay? It's not a good theory, but it's one in which Americans sort of have to deal with. And so showing good health and hygiene is a way that Virginians can show they're not losing their refinement, that they're not losing their gentility. And so taking good care of your hair is a way to do this, and there's a way that refined British folks do that. And wearing wigs is part of that. And we have lots of wig hair curlers. Um, let's see if I can sort of use the pointer here. There we go. So these are bits of bone combs. The teeth are so fragile, they rot away pretty quickly. Um, and then this hairbrush, all the bristles rot away. Um, this is one of the earliest hairbrushes ever made. So before the mid-1700s, you're just using those lice combs. It's in the mid-1700s that hairbrushes like that are first available. Um, I have a 3D replica of it up here, so you can take a look at it. Um, so. This is used for natural hair, and it had a handle, so it's a woman's hairbrush. So, probably Mary's, she's living there the longest, possibly Betty's. You don't use this on wig hair, you use this on natural hair. So, and this is pretty innovative. Um, and of course, the wig hair curlers. Keeping good health and hygiene was important. Now, here's a tale from George's diary, and it's 1747, he's, 15 years old or so, he's going out west to survey, and he talks about, they go to this tavern, this is early on before they get out into the deep woods, and they have dinner, and then they go into the room, and the caretaker takes him up with the candle, and then the caretaker leaves, and when he leaves, he takes the candle with him, okay, there's no more light for them. But the George stripped down himself very orderly and went to the bed, as they called it, when to my surprise, I found it to be nothing but a little straw, matted together, without sheets or anything else, but only one threadbare blanket with double its weight of vermin, such as lice, the fleas, etc. Okay, now this is the kind of bed most Virginians are living in. But what this, this tells us a lot about George's life at Ferry Farm, right? He didn't know there was such a thing as beds that didn't have mattresses and didn't have sheets or that had bugs in them, okay? His companions that are with him, that are experienced woodmen, they kept their clothes on and slept on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and he says after this that that's what he did. As soon as the caretaker was gone, he put his clothes back on and slept on the floor and slept on the floor from then on. And of course, when they're out in the deep woods, he's sleeping out in the woods on the you know, but that he ne didn't know what this was like, that he had never experienced a bed without sheets or bed clothes with bugs in them, tells you something about the quality of life that he's enjoying at Ferry Farm. And that quality of life is possible by the enslaved population that's there. They're the ones that are washing those sheets and making sure they're pressed and clean and put on the bed every, as often as they did so. Um, some other evidence of health and hygiene. Uh, in 1752, George comes back from Barbados. Uh, he's been there with his brother and he caught smallpox when he was there. It was a good thing because he was immune from that for the rest of his life. But he, uh, his mother buys from the local doctor some ointment for his smallpox scars. Interestingly, in 1758, he's not married yet. He's living at Mount Vernon. But he's suffering from dysentery, and he's heading for Williamsburg, but he stops at Ferry Farm for a number of days to convalesce, okay? He could have stopped at his sister's house, he could have stayed at a tavern, he could have just 
driven himself on to Williamsburg, but he made a point of coming home to mom. <laughs> Okay, if she was as awful as Morrison makes her out to be, I, I think he would have found something else to do, some other way to cope. So I think this is a compelling argument that mom's not all that bad. And we find a number of medicinal bottles. This isn't a comprehensive photo, this is just some examples of some of the medicine bottles that we found at Fairy Farm. In 1771, George surveys the property. He's getting ready to sell it. They originally tried to get mom out of Ferry Farm at seven, uh, in 1760, um, but she's having none of it. She stays, she's clearly enjoying managing the place and living on her own. By 1760, all the kids are gone. She's in a capacious house by herself. And so, 1771, she's been ill enough, she's getting elderly enough that the kids convince her to move into town. And so George surveys the property. Now he does not draw the survey, okay? This map you're looking at was drawn from his notes in the 1930s. Um, and an interesting thing, uh, he doesn't draw the house, okay? So you can see the improvements that the Washingtons have made. There's fence lines, there's a garden, there's a hen yard. Let's see if I can, I don't have a, there you go. So there's the garden, there's the hen yard. George doesn't draw the map because he's not interested, I, I don't think, in the features. When he advertises it, he doesn't show this map, but he wants to see the boundaries. He wants to see if anyone's encroached on it, how the fence lines are, etc. Some people suggest, and in his advertisement, he doesn't mention the current house. He mentions that it's a good vantage point uh, to see the town of Fredericksburg. Um, but it's likely that this house into which the Washingtons move, uh, which was built by the previous family, the Strother family, uh, was in such a state of disrepair or age, it was a frame structure, that it in its, of itself wasn't worth a lot at this time. But we do know that people moved into that house after Mary left. So that map is a good map to show us some of the features and some of the ways in which the Washingtons improved the property and made it more civilized. So here's, here's a map that shows some excavation. Let me see if I can get the mouse working again. There you go. So look for this north arrow. So, because I'm gonna change that on you in a couple of these. So north is to the right of the image and I've got George's map oriented the same way. And this is what post holes look like. And we found a particularly important line of post holes here. So we have a fence line that's so important, it's established in the colonial era, and you can see the Washington fence posts there on the left. And then in the antebellum era, those posts were replaced. This is such an important fence line, and it's between the house and the work yard. I wish I had a pointer. So, all right, look at your north arrow. Now we're looking south. I've oriented George's map, so that it's sort of oriented the same way, we've got this fence line that we've been able to find. This is what a fence looks like after a couple of hundred years. And we know it's important because it's pulled in the colonial era, uh, and it's established in the colonial era, it's pulled in the early 1800s and replaced with new posts. Um, the preservation was so keen on one of those colonial posts that the excavator was able to see that it was a square post and it was pointed in two directions, not four, but two. So the bottom of that post was pointed as someone could sort of hammer it in a little bit deeper. Um, and so this is probably one of those fence lines you see to the right. We're not sure which one it is. So all these lines George has drawn over here, that he surveyed over here, are fence lines that separates the house from the rest of the yard. This fence line is heading for this feature here. The next slide shows a little bit better. Um, it is a cellar. We haven't excavated this cellar yet. So the, the, there's the cellar. It's a little bit darker area. There's a feature. There's a feature. Here's another post hole and a post hole. Uh, we haven't excavated that yet. So this is what this is what that wide area of exposure that this excavation gets you. You can find fence lines, you can find these features. And while we haven't excavated this feature yet, this yellow era, arrow shows you where it is between the house and the workyard. 
each one of those squares is a five by five foot unit. You can see the house there. When we plot where the Washington's trash is, that's what we mean by this, this trash mitten, that's all the Washington era garbage, the ceramics, the glass, the wrought nails. The Washingtons are pitching that out the back door, okay? And this is a classic British pattern, okay? Uh, this, the Dutch don't do this, but the British do this. And so, on the left side of your slide is the Rappahannock River and the town of Fredericksburg, okay? It's very evident from our excavations that the Washingtons are preserving that viewshed in a very neat and orderly way. And the work yard uh, is, is hidden from that view by the house itself. But, you see where that yellow arrow is? That's pointing right to a, a little concentration of those same mid-1700s materials. That tells us two things. We haven't excavated that cellar but it's got the same mid-1700s trash above it, and that's domestic in nature. We're not looking at a stable. You wouldn't find all those domestic artifacts above a stable. So we don't know what it is yet, but I'd be willing to bet that it's Washington era. Um, this shows all our excavations. You can see the area up to the north. We've got uh, a number of outbuildings we found that are shown by different cellars. The kitchen, which was visible in the basement of the house that used to stand there, the storehouse, and various outbuildings that we're currently analyzing. Um, again, there's the Rappahannock River, the town of Fredericksburg. That area beside the quarter, boy, they really wanted me to find a garden there, and there is no garden there. It's never been plowed. And so that tells us that the enslaved people had a provisional garden elsewhere. So. Nothing is marring that neatness that's, being, that's visible from the town and from the river. Um, that work yard is being hidden from uh, the view by the house. And so this landscape is a replication of the social order. You can see the main house where the family lives. You can see the kitchen. You can see the quarter. And the view from the town all reflects a civilized family, not a family that's degrading or becoming lazy, uh, as this European theory suggests. Uh, this is a, a well-organized landscape. Um, that work yard is dominated by wig hair curlers. <laughs> and we have a number of 3D replicas up here you can look at that are printed out in plastic, so I hope you'll come take a look at those. We have 214 of them. That's way more than any other domestic site of which I'm aware has. Um, these are used to set wig curls. You don't use this on your natural hair. And wearing wigs is an emblem of male gentility. And so if you think about the court cases that are rocking the family, one slave's murdering another, someone's stealing George's clothes while he goes swimming, one of the ways you can sort of demonstrate to the community that things are in control is that you're showing proper health and hygiene, that your wigs are neat uh, and exemplary, that you're behaving in a very refined way, and wigs are one of the ways you can show that. Remember, each one of these squares represents a five by five. That brown smear there is their trash bin. Those numbers represent how many curlers come from each five by five. Okay? Now, it's not evenly distributed, okay? It's not like there's one curler per unit. It's not evenly scattered. They're concentrated. And that's one of the ways we were able to identify this work yard. Remember, these soils are not plowed. This is crazy unusual, folks. Um, and so there's a concentration here that's pretty easy to see. And then inside the parlor, that's the parlor room. And it's hard to read, but we have uh, in the root cellar, in front of the parlor fireplace, that's a count of six and a count of two. We don't have any other unit that has six wig hair curlers. So this tells us that something's going on in the parlor, maybe some of the final touches of curling wigs or setting a man and putting on a gentleman's head is going on in the parlor. Who writes down about how your wig is maintained? Nobody. And so archaeology is a way that we can tease out this information. How do we know how this is going on? This seems to be a pretty innovative approach for dealing with wigs. 
if you live in a town like Alexandria or Williamsburg, you probably have your choice of wig shops and hairdressers. Here in Fredericksburg, you don't have that choice. And so the Washingtons are maintaining their wigs at their home. Now, why so many curlers? There's a couple of reasons. They're either really fastidious or they get really cheap wigs. Because <laughs> if you buy cheap wigs, they need to be curled more often. And I don't know that we'll ever know that. And there's very little comparative data. Nobody digs sites like this. Nobody has a distribution map like this. I think it's really easy when we're all sort of in the middle of this to take this for granted, but this is really unusual to have this much data. So we did some cross mending, um, and this shows 10 of those cross mends. What's great about curlers is they tend to break in half. So when you talk about glass vessels or ceramic vessels, they'll break into hundreds of fragments. Curlers are awesome because they break, they tend to break in half. And so you get a one-to-one -one correlation like this, and it sort of confirms that link between the work yard and the parlor. What's more, when I look at that work yard, I swear I can tell where that guy was standing and curling wigs. There's a certain area where they're all pointing to um, and of course, he would have been facing south because you wouldn't have wanted to stand and have the sun in your in, in the way of your work. So, education department, when you're ready to do that, let me know. I'll tell you. <laughs> so, what's the legacy of this? You know, <clears throat> I love Jack Warren, and he says that Lawrence Austin and later the Fairfaxes provided the jo provided George with the models of gentility he otherwise would have lacked. What's the archaeology say about that? Okay, this is one of those slides that I can, can condense like three, four slides down into one. There's lots of artifacts of gentility, of entertaining here. The tambour hook that Betty's using to do fancy needlework. Tea wares, we have tea cups and uh, teapots, teaspoons. Fancy stem wares, ground decanter stoppers from, for um, alcoholic beverages flipped glass tumblers. This is a home that's welcoming people in and socializing. Even their dinnerwares, and I have 3D replicas here today of this spoon. You should come up and take a look at that. Um, using forks is still a pretty elegant and, 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 and something that sort of gentility we find people are using. Uh, a lot of people, you know, per the 17th century practice, are using knives to pierce their food and convey it to their mouth. There's a European that's watching an American mother late in the 1700s, and she's poking that knife and sticking it in her baby's mouth to feed it, and the European is just horrified by this. So the Washington children, this is a didactic house, okay? It's full of the tools that Mary and Augustine Washington's children need to become model citizens, to become uh, really good uh, prospects for good marriages. And I can tell you those spoons reflect their English diet, okay? The French spoons are nowhere near that large. The French are pureeing their soups. Those English still have big chunks of vegetables and meat and probably bone in their stews, okay? So even that spoon reflects their ethnicity, the Washington ethnicity, that they're British. Um, Here's a hinge for a card table, okay? There's no card table in Augustine Washington's probate inventory. And these tables can be folded and put away, but when you want to play cards, you can bring it out and unfold it. Um, it's a home that's welcoming and allows people to socialize. And that's important because Mary wants all her children to marry well. It's hard to think of George as a child. I wanted to show some of the things that reflect his boyhood. We have a number of marbles. They're made of stone. They're made of clay. Um, we have these talio sleeve buttons. George loved fox hunting, and this is a very genteel pursuit as well. You have to own horses, and you have to have the leisure time to go gallivanting across the countryside chasing after a horse. I recently took a closer look at these uh, fox links uh, because they appear on a number of early American, early republic forts and in the revolutionary era. 
why are these why are soldiers wearing these fox hunting sleeve buttons? Um, and I drew a link based on circumstantial evidence um, that these might be related to Charles Fox. And you can find this on our blog, the Lives and Legacies blog from our July uh, period. Um, Charles Fox hated King George. He was a British parliamentarian. He understood and supported the colonial cause. He was also an abolitionist. So uh, I believe it's in South Carolina. They found one of these in a slave quarter. Okay, I don't think the slaves are hunting foxes. They, maybe they're fans of fox hunting. That's a possible explanation. Or maybe they're fans of Charles Fox because they know he's an abolitionist. Um, there's this satirical image from the time that shows Charles Fox's image on a fox in the exact way it's shown on these Talio buttons. Um, the word Talio, actually, if you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, they put it, I think, as originating in 1775, but our sleeve buttons come from a 1760s level. So through archaeology, we could actually correct the Oxford English Dictionary. So I think Bill Gardner's working on that now. Um, fishing, George loves fish. Um, his tackle box, Mount Vernon, has that tackle box. Take a look at the ends of those fish hooks. They don't have eyes for putting the thread through. You have to tie them. They're, it's called smelling it to the line. Um, this is one of the things you do as a small finds analyst is you, you find out details like that. And so here's a fish hook coming out of our wet screen. This was recovered from uh, the storehouse cellar. And we have a number of fish hooks from the site. Um, equestrian pursuits, so we know Mary Ball loves horses. This is a family that can afford horses. Horses are expensive to buy, they're expensive to keep, and the Washingtons do love their horses. One of the things that the Foundation uh, believes in, and Dave Baranca has directed, is let's go deep in our understanding. Most places would say, okay, this is a you know, one horseshoe, and put it in a bag and put it in storage and sort of forget about it. Um, we've researched these horseshoes, and what's fascinating about these, and I've got a 3D replica of that particular specimen right here, um, it's a heavily worn shoe. So that's the ground surface there. In the upper right, you can see that it's worn, so it was probably replaced as opposed to being a thrown shoe. And see how the branches are extra wide at the bottom? That's an English thing, okay? So before horseshoes are mass produced, um, they make these wide branches, that's an English thing to do. So there are ways that the Washingtons are expressing their Britishness that they're not even conscious of. And this is in the Diderot. If you look up horseshoes in Diderot, he shows one picture of this and it says for English, okay? So Diderot looks at this. And that's a famous set of books of drawings of mechanic exercises of the time. So. Um, so it's thrown, it's a rear shoe, it has very minor caulkins. So at the bottom, you see better caulkins in this next example. Here's a post-1750 shoe. Those little heels that the shoe has are called caulkins. At the time, it was believed that it gave the horse a little extra traction. Uh, it's something that's around in the 1700s, a little in the 1800s. It's not used much today. So there's a lot of, there's, ethnic data in this, there's chronological data in this. If you, gosh, go through the effort and you have the luxury of time to do the research to find that out. So, lots of horseshoes, and you know, we have a civil war here, the Union Army's based at Ferry Farm. We have lots of horseshoes, and distinguishing the 20th century from the 19th century from the 18th century horseshoes is something that the Foundation does and is worth doing. Um, Buckles, we have some utilitarian buckles that reflect some of the harnesses and the tack that's being used. Um, these are utilitarian buckles. This isn't our entire assemblage, but you can see we find lots of them. Some of them are used uh, for horse tack, but these are such uh, utilitarian buckles, lots of multi-functions that you can use these for. I can't say that they're all used for horses, but we sure find a lot of them, and certainly a lot of them are used for horses. Um, we find the bits, we find spurs, this is a nice 18th century spur. Uh, we have uh, stirrups, this is a swivel stirrup, and so 
that, that top little circle allows the stirrup to spin, which makes it easier to get on your horse. I have a colleague in Boston that found one like this from a much later context. Um, but swivel stirrups are also really handy when you're riding side saddle, and so it's possible that Mary might have used a stirrup like a uh, uh, stirrup like this to get on her horses. Um, leather ornaments. So these are purely an embellishment for horse tack. Okay, as though it's not enough that you're riding around on a horse, you're putting these brass ornaments on the tack, and it's just a way of attracting more attention to yourself. What's interesting is when you purchase these, these are something that come out of men's account books. And a husband and wife team, the husband buys these sorts of embellishments. If the horse gets sick and you have to call the vet, that comes out of the wife's budget. <laughs> okay, we're just stuck with dealing with sick things, so even in the horse uh, realm. And so, the Washingtons like them some leather ornaments because they have a lot of them. A lot of them. <laughs> and this isn't comprehensive, but here you've looked at the majority of our collection. If you look at the one in the lower left, it's never been used. Its prongs are still sticking straight up. So that was purchased, but they never actually applied it. The others are bent over, and you can see how it's bent to uh, affix to a leather strap. Um, this is an example, it hasn't been uh, conserved yet, but there are three pieces of leather that you can see that are conserved. Copper has naturally antimicrobial process, uh, properties, and so it preserves organic things that typically would erode away. And so we have three bits of leather that are preserved there. That's a pretty cool thing. Um, this also happens with copper alloy buttons. So this is a button that we recovered in 2015 from the main Washington cellar. And on the back of it, there was thread preserved. And if you look real carefully, most of that thread is white, but there's some blue thread, and there's some amber, or maybe it's red. Maybe it's red, white, and blue thread in George Washington. <laughs> So I took this uh, to Williamsburg to have the uh, conservators look at it there, and they're pretty jaded there in Colonial Williamsburg. <laughs> They've seen thread on the back of buttons, you know, but when the conservator turned it over, she's like, oh, there's a lot, you know, so even to their jaded eyes, that was a lot. They were able to identify it as cotton, so if you look at those threads, see how they sort of pinch and twist? That's a characteristic of cotton. So they were able to identify it as cotton thread, which has a whole interesting dimension to it as well for cotton from this time period. Uh, that blue co co color comes from indigo, and so the chemistry department at William and Mary got involved. Uh, and this is what you get for free. You find out that it's indigo, but if you want to find out if it's South Carolina indigo or Caribbean indigo, well, that costs a little more money. So we'll set aside a budget for that, right, right, Mr. Marantha? So, um, so. Indigo, there are vast indigo plantations in South Carolina. Um, so that was sort of interesting to see, and we have that preserved there. Nice, interesting thing. Here's Mr. Moraka. <laughs> he gave me a call a couple of years ago, and he wasn't in a good mood. And that's unusual, because he's usually in a bad mood after he talks to me. <laughs> but he asked, you know, do we have any evidence for shutters on the Washington house? And I always like to say yes to Dave Maraca, but this is what the evidence for shutters looks like. Remember, Ferry Farm is built in 1727-1728 by the Struther family, okay? And so what you have are these pull rings and staples. It's a rather, a rather unrefined way to open and close shutters, but it is a classic early Baroque way to do it. And so the George Washington Foundation between Kenmore and Ferry Farm sort of bookends the Georgian period, and we have great examples of both. So we're going to have our shutters on Ferry Farm, and they're going to reflect these sort of early Baroque, still rather rustic by late Georgian standards, shutter hardware. Some household accessories, I'll show these really quickly. We have a fire steel, I know some of you have seen this before. 
I have a 3D replica. What's great about the replica, as soon as Dr. Means printed this out, I was able to try it, you know, mm -hmm. to sort of see how it worked. Um, I don't do that with the original. I don't touch the original very much at all. What's interesting about this is the embellishment it has. Those little curly cues at the end. Fire steels in the 1700s are pretty utilitarian. They don't usually have that kind of embellishment. And I wonder if this particular one did because the Washingtons owned an iron mine and that this was perhaps made from iron from that mine, a way of advertising, hey, here's, here's some iron from Agakee. This fire steel was made. I don't know. Now, I'm sure there's an expensive way you can find that out. I'd probably have to be let go in order for them to afford it, but <laughs> not that I'm giving anyone any ideas. Here's some fragmentary remains. I'm really proud of, of the interpretation of this because Winterthur couldn't figure it out and the archaeologists at Williamsburg didn't figure this out. I didn't ask the curators. But this is what happens to chamber sticks after they've been in the ground for hundreds of years. And these are from the parlor root cellar. And these are from layers that are definitely Washington and era. And so chamber sticks are, you might think of them as candle holders, but it's a specific kind of candle holder where you have that brass pan. And it's very thin, so it rots away, but sort of the reinforced rims of it are what preserve after hundreds of years. Um, here's a nice sort of hard to decipher thing. I took this to my friends at Williamsburg. They were able to find the exact kind of hand scales these represent. Exactly. These would have been used for medicine, for uh, recipes, uh, for currency. Um, this would have been used a lot, and it's a way we can furnish the house accurately. So what are we left with? Who, who is Mary Washington? Is she virtuous, prudent? kind and maternal, or is she this grasping, querulous, vulgar, selfish person? In some ways, we're kind of fortunate that George's father passed away, because all the material culture that dates from after his death, we can attribute to her consumer decisions. Not both George's parents, but her specifically, that they reflect the way she manages this house and this family. And so I referred to this quote earlier, from one of George's cousins that talks about how he's more afraid of George's mom than his own parents. But he adds that he, she awed me in the midst of her kindness, for she was indeed truly kind. But what's happened to this quote, and I think what would horrify Lawrence Washington of Chotang, is it's been taken out of context. Here's another lesson about context. When we're teaching people about primary documents and secondary documents, Here's one about context. Because people have used that he, they're afraid of her as a way of denigrating her, and they drop the kind. Here's Mr. Flexner, Mr. Fleming, Mr. Warren, Mr. Wynchick, Mr. Weed, Ron Chernow. Who goes on to add, there's nothing especially gentle about Mary Washington, little that savored of maternal warmth. They're going way over the top. I think they're going beyond what the documentary records say about Mary Washington. I think they've extended their grasp. And what is it that they don't remember that kind part of it? And the guy goes on to say, that cousin goes on to say, even now that time has whitened my locks, I, I, I can't, I'm paraphrasing, um, I, I still can't think of that woman uh, in ways that, the words that I just can't express. And boy, I wish you could have found the words to express them, because that afraid quote is what gets, what tempers people today. Um, here's a citation from 2000. You know, Mary Ball died an embittered woman in 1789 at age 83. She's 82, it says it in the obituary. These people can't even read English. <laughs> Washington did not attend her funeral. George lived in New York. He found out about her death a week after she died. In August. <laughs> I won't leave my fish on the counter for a day in August. Um, if George returned right away, it would have been two weeks after she died. So this is a true statement. 
This is where you have to add the context. George knew when he left to be president and left for New York that he was seeing his mom for the last time. And he said in a letter that the disease, she died from breast cancer, had reduced her to a skeleton. He was clearly upset by that. It bothered him. And when he got word that his mother died, he was at the dinner table at the time, he got up and left the room and was alone for a while. Was he just putting on a show for his guests? I, I don't think so. But you can interpret it that way if you want. But boy, you better interpret it. You better address it. Here's Tom, here's Flexner from his autobiography, Maverick's Progress. And there's a hint, if you name your autobiography, Maverick's Progress, okay, you, you, you sort of know what to expect, right? And so he's written about George Washington, marvelous, thoroughly researched stuff. And he says, it would take a, a discovery of blockbuster impact. It's hard to conceive where it would come from that would do more than change details in a study like mine. <laughs> I think the archaeology that's been going on at Ferry Farm does more than change those details. I think it forces us to reconsider some of these tales and why these narratives have evolved. Okay, why is it hard to believe that Mary was found innocent of growing second-rate tobacco? Okay. Why do we still find it hard to believe, even with a jury of 12 men and contemporaries saying that? Why do we hold on to the fact that people are afraid of her and not that they go on to say how kind she is? This is your site. We lost it. Okay, there was a strip mall. They had the plans. It was bought. It was a done deal. And it was the local citizens that sat out there and saved this site. And this is what, this is what we have won for it. Here's our, our buddy Flexner again. Although he never lacked for food or warm clothes, George Washington would have been ashamed to take his friends to his mother's run-down farm. Okay? We have artifacts that say the story is at the very least more complicated than that, if not outright wrong. But here's, here's Edward Lengel from his 2011 book. He just came out with another one last year. And he says, many of Flexner's imaginative me meanderings were harmless if not always entirely plausible. I don't think these narratives are harmless. Look at this illustration from a child's book, okay? That's Mary on the left side. She looks horrible, and everyone at that table looks horrible. <laughs> okay. That's, that, I don't think that's what the house was like, okay? George came back, he's sick in 1758. He's not married yet. He comes home to mom for some nursing before he heads down to Williamsburg. We need to reassess these narratives, and we don't have to stand for them anymore. Thanks for coming. I want to um, plug a few things with the George Washington Foundation. So our website is kenmore.org. Find out about our upcoming events, our Lives and Legacies blog, Always fresh and new information there, our latest discoveries. We have a number of pamphlets in the back about our upcoming gingerbread workshops. Miss um, Alma, did you want to announce anything about this coming uh, month? Any exciting events going on in October? I think October the 7th is going to be a very exciting time for Prairie Farm. We're going to, we're going to dedicate so there's going to be a ribbon cutting at Ferry Farm on October 7th. We just, got, we just announced this on our website. Um, and so I hope you'll come and celebrate this. Let me tell you, the stories you've heard today are just the beginning. We're going to be getting new information and new perspectives about this American family for generations to come. And this, this has been a long time in coming. The community has been very patient. Uh, and we want to thank you for that and hope you'll continue to support us. Thank you. All right, we have a lot of experts in the room tonight. 
Are there any questions? Any tomatoes? All right, I see Mr. Fenimore back there. He was the first one. Yes, sir. You talked about the fire stick. What is a fire stick? And how was it used? Talking about our strike light here? Yeah. So this is used to create a spark. So you strike a piece of flint with this and it creates a spark to start a fire. So yes, that's a, that's a great question. Right, that's that's a, an example of me assuming knowledge. So thank you, Mr. Fenning. You, you just keep me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> All right, yes, Matt. Was the house called very referred to as Curry Farm or was it referred to something else when the Washingtons were there? When the Washingtons are there, they call it home house. Okay, it's not called Ferry Farm until the 19th century. There is a ferry that crosses uh, the, the river there, and George refers to it rather annoyingly in a letter, so it, it clearly bothers him, because um, people walk through their property, and they don't benefit from it in any way. Um, so there is a ferry there, uh, but it's not called Ferry Farm until the 19th century. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, could the curlers have come from the floor above? Those high counts are actually from the root cellar. So they, no, they're actually, that root cellar, that's a good question, and that's a good theory. That root cellar is filled, we think, when Mary leaves. And even though there are families that are living there afterwards, um, that, that, that we think that's where they were actually used. So that's a great question. And your skepticism is, is, is good. Keep, keep it up. You keep questioning things. I see, I see a young lady down here. Um, is there any way to know how many curlers they used to actually set one wig? What a great question. Oh, so how many curlers do you need for a wig? There are so many different styles, it varies. So some wigs just have two tiers, some have six tiers. Some of them, there's a wig called a cauliflower. That's nothing but a bunch of tiny curls. And so it's just so very, and some have no curls, but they're never fashionable, okay? Curled hair is always more fashionable than non-curled hair. So it's highly variable. We have nine different sizes of curlers there as well. So there's lots of evidence uh, that the curling is taking place there. And we actually have residues on it that we've analyzed that we think reflect the hair powder that was being used there. And it was cheap hair powder. Okay. We were able to determine cheap hair powder. So. All right, more questions. Yes, sir. Do you have archaeological evidence that the house was painted red during Washington's time? Do we have archaeological evidence? Yes, uh, that the house is painted red. We have a gentleman that's interviewed in the early 1800s that remembers that the house was red. And then we, we have also uh, recovered plaster that has red on it. Now, I don't know, if, I know Mr. Maranca isn't prepared to talk tonight, but he could certainly talk about how that color was selected. And I know Miss Alma's got a wireless microphone that she could just... Uh, next week, Megan Buttinger, our curator, is going to do a, a presentation, and she's going to be talking about how, how we're furnishing the house based on the ar archaeology. So it's next week at 7 o'clock, and Megan's going to talk to you about that. So it's the full cycle. Um, and then, of course, October 7th is our dedication. Now, now, young Dave, do you want to say anything about the color of the house? Because um, he's worked a lot on this reconstruction, and he's he's worked there longer, so. So, so uh, this is an incredibly popular color. It's a very inexpensive color early in the 18th century, and um, if you if you look at the history of paint analysis over through the 20th century. The, uh, as the later it gets, the more often they find red at the base of uh, architectural samples where they do paint analysis. Red is incredibly popular early on in the 18th century. Thank you, Dave. Is that, is that a good answer to that question? All right, what else, my friends? I have, I have 3D replicas up here that you can interact with. You should try to stick this English spoon in your mouth. I dare you. I don't think you can do it. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for coming out. Yeah.